Today we embark on the saga of one man. A man with a plan. The person I speak of is Herr Schnitzel Nazi. I DM slash GM myself, so I am fully aware of how annoying we players can be. But no matter how hard I try to take the game seriously, I always just end up making a completely insane or weird character. I might sometimes be that guy, but I really don't care. I just love making interesting or weird characters so much. The character in question this time was in a game of Call of Cthulhu. The game was run by the Tabletop Gaming Club at my university. I was unsure about joining at first, but my best friend here convinced me to join with him. I had been playing D&D for a long time, and while games of that were on offer, I really wanted to play some Call of Cthulhu, and I was extra happy when my friend wanted to join it with me. The GM for the game seemed like a pretty chill guy, and so did everyone else, so I was pretty happy with it overall. I didn't go into the game completely in the dark. I had wanted to play Call of Cthulhu for years, and had learned the system and everything. I had also spent plenty of time listening to the hilarious stories of famous characters, i.e. Old Man Henderson, Bonesy the Sad Clown, etc. I decided to try and make my own character who would out-crazy them all. His name was Herr Schnitzel Nazi, and as you could have guessed, he was a Nazi. But despite what you're thinking, the guy was born in America and was black. He went to college and became a doctor and moved to Germany after medical school. Unfortunately for him, the Nazis got into power, and if you know your history, they weren't fond of black people. Because he couldn't really easily escape, he decided instead to change his name, relocate, and whiteface himself so that he appeared white. If you get the reference, then I respect you. He changed his name to the most German thing that he could think of, which was Schnitzel Nazi. By the time of the war's beginning, Herr Schnitzel Nazi had risen to the rank of Hitler's private doctor. I should also clarify that to further protect himself, he decided to embrace all of the ideologies of the Nazis. Because of this, I was also able to justify that he received military training and had one of those hilarious belt buckle guns that Hitler's private bodyguards had on. Only, he modified it so that it fired after he did a pelvic thrust. After the war, Herr Schnitzel Nazi was captured by the Americans and tried desperately to convince them that he was both black and American. Unfortunately for him, due to the fact that he had been undercover for so long, his accent was so irreversibly German, and the makeup he was using had permanently stained his skin white. As a result, his rather stupid American bodyguards didn't believe him. He spent the next 10 years being experimented on, which made him completely insane as a result. He then very much began to believe in the ideologies of the Nazis, and completely forgot that he was black. After 10 years, he escaped in a lab fire and went to an old Nazi safe house in Germany. There, he acquired everything that he needed and what Hitler had given him to protect. This included an entire arsenal of weapons, including Lugers, Sturmgewehr 44s, MG42s, an honest working Flammenwerfer, and boxes upon boxes of ammunition, stick grenades, and landmines. He also has millions of dollars of Nazi gold and even the original copy of the Mona Lisa. I joked that in this universe the Nazis had the real one, and the one in Paris is a fake. He returned to America after smuggling all of his materials inside, and using an apartment as a staging ground. Herr Schnitzel Nazi then used decades of time to prepare for the coming of the Fourth Reich. This included keeping the weapons in good condition, training, and keeping himself physically fit. He used his Nazi gold in his day job as a dog groomer to survive and collect more supplies. Just to make it all even funnier, he wears his Nazi SS uniform, which he never takes off for any reason. He's also an alcoholic, and learned to appreciate the wonders of weed. Over his years of stewing in his own madness, he's fully embraced the flat earth and hollow earth ideas. He has also developed rather major phobias of communists, the Battle of Kursk, pirates, books, and spoons. And lastly, 
While he still embraces a Nazi ideology, he can no longer remember who he hates. So, he has decided to blame all his hate and misfortunes on Vietnam and Scientology, despite never having any contact with either. When I brought this character to the session, I honestly thought they were going to make me roll up a new one. But I was pleasantly surprised when the DM told me that he was actually excited to see me roleplay this crazy fucker. But then I got a look at everyone else's characters, and that's when I realized that this was going to be the weirdest campaign I've ever played. The first character was a nine-year-old girl who worshipped mattresses, lived in a mall Sears for most of her life, and was a master at throwing knives. She also roleplayed the girl like a fucking psychopath. The next character was a U.S. Senator named Dick Fister. My thoughts, too. The character was role-played like the most stereotypical American patriotic senator you could imagine. Think McCarthy on steroids. Despises anything that isn't capitalism. Death is a preferable alternative to communism. Calls his enemies commies and uses a massive 44 magnum shape to look like a bald eagle, which he named Freedom. After him was the president of the Tabletop Club. He role-played the only sane character in the group. He was an overzealous bodyguard who acted like Dick Fister's security. The only weird thing about him was his name, B.J. Gobbledick. Next was the president's girlfriend, who was, honest to God, the funniest role-player I've ever seen. Simp. She played the character Chuck the Lump. This guy was a redneck farmer with an axe and a double-barreled shotgun. He was also indescribably stupid. I could not describe to you how well she role-played his stupidity. It was so good. Lastly was my friend's character, and it was probably the weirdest, second only to mind. Remember Joseph Coney, the African warlord? Yeah, the guy role-played Joseph Coney in all his glory. He role-played him perfectly, and the GM allowed him to have what was probably the funniest ability I've ever seen. It was Summon Child Soldier. This allowed him to summon 1d8 child soldiers under his command, each with an AK-47. They were really weak, but could deal a good amount of damage, and were perfect for covering escapes and working as cannon fodder. So you guys want a highlight reel? Alright, sounds good to me. I have a few more stories, but I think that it's best to start at the very beginning, so let's do that. Our group was supposed to meet at some sort of commune in the vast forest of Montana. I honestly intended for us to start in a large city, hence my apartment filled with an ass ton of weapons. I felt as though it put a damper on my playstyle, but I decided to roll with the punches. I asked the GM if I could, instead of my apartment, keep my entire arsenal and personal wealth in my car instead. Him, being the cool guy he is, said sure. The car that I chose for Herr Schnitzel Nazi was a Pinto Cruising Wagon, an absolutely hideous car that I felt fitted his character. I would also later learn that the car's major defect is that it would often explode on its own if it got into a crash, particularly particularly, particularly, if it was rear-ended. Anyways, while Coney was hitching a ride with the trucker to get to the commune, the nine-year-old girl Mackenzie was riding up in Chuck's rusty old pickup truck, and Senator Fister and Gobbledick were arriving by helicopter. I, in full SS attire, drove right up, keeping a Sturmgewehr, Luger, and a single stick grenade, Stelgranat, and my trusty belt buckle gun on me. Welcome, friends. I'm Director Nathan, said some guy dressed in a white jumpsuit who was waiting for us at the gates. I'm assuming we all arrived at the same time for dramatic timing. This guy starts telling us the history of this town, something about how an environmentally aware company helped them set up, and how this community was completely green and completely self-sufficient. My Nazi senses were immediately tingling, and I didn't trust these guys. My character was insane in 92 at this point in his life, so I decided to start old manning the shit out of this. I started going on a classic old man rant, 
Only I'm also talking about how I thought they were communist hippie Viet Cong. I threw a lot of Pepperidge Farm references in there as well, and started talking about the good old days of Nazi Germany. In game, everyone is just staring at me, until eventually the senator cuts me off. Ignore this fascist fuck bucket, he says. I'm looking to help get the votes from your crowd, and I understand they love all this useless hippie stuff. We all go on talking to director Nathan for a while, till eventually he asks us to fix some power chip that keeps the water purifier running. Is this a Fallout reference? And how if we don't fix it, then no more clean water. Insert Fallout joke here. Okay. And we head off. I have a high drive skill, which I justify by saying that I drove Hitler's staff car, but Gobbledick decides that he wants to drive instead. Me being crazy, I immediately whip out the grenade and immediately start accusing Gobbledick of being a Scientologist. They all freak out a little and they insist on confiscating the grenade. I half-heartedly agree, but promise that I will have it back. Out of game, Gobbledick turned to me and said, Isn't this grenade like 70 years old? I nod, and he starts laughing. He told me that he's played with the GM before, and he's the kind of guy who might make the grenade go off on his belt if he were in the mood. So, without anyone else knowing, he hands the grenade back to me. So after wrecking two of the jeeps we were supposed to take to the water plant, the GM says that we see a windowless white van pull up to us. Coney immediately puts McKenzie out of view, because we were all thinking exactly the same thing. The driver seems like a normal guy and introduces himself as Phil. We tell him we need to get to the water purifier, but he just laughs and says that he fixed it this morning. He then invites us to go with him to take care of some compost at a plant that will pack it as fertilizer. Seeing nothing else to do, we go with him. The job basically required the stronger people in the party, which basically left everyone but me and Mackenzie. Mackenzie, being the little girl she is, says she holds the door. I, on the other hand, start feeling my Nazi senses tingling again, so I decide to investigate. I head outside the plant, slipping away before anyone can notice me leaving. I start sneaking around the building when suddenly I hear something just beyond the corner. I roll for a stealth check but just barely don't make it. The GM says that I hear a low growl and something scraping along the wall just around the corner from me. I decide to go into battle mode. I pull the pin on my grenade and yell, Surprise, cockbag! From the other's point of view, they're just working away, when suddenly they hear a deafening explosion along the outside of the wall, which causes massive structural damage in the form of a huge dent and in turn knocks over some of the heavy machinery right on to poor Phil, who gets pinned under. Eh, I mean, steel grenades for a concussion grenade. No, I don't think so, Chief, but whatever. While the others rush out guns drawn, I'm standing there holding the pieces of what looked like a hairless rodent of unusual size, the R.O.U.S.'s, by what's left of its tail. When the others get to me, I hold them up at Luger Point and say, I killed it. I get to eat it. After much arguing and debating and ignoring poor Phil, we head back to the plant and notice that everyone is gone. Phil from under his machinery and all of the other workers. Cars are all still there, but no people. All that's left was a mysterious green goo. Chuck decides that he wants to eat it, but fortunately Coney convinces him otherwise. After some debate, we decide to go on a manhunt for the others, because apparently the others haven't seen a horror movie in their entire life. While we search the rest of the building, Coney decided that now was the time to use his once per day child soldier ability. <laughs> okay. He ordered them to patrol the farm fields just outside the building and look for anything of note. Chuck, despite being a complete moron, is actually the only one of us with any experience around farming equipment, and proves to be of some use. Particularly when we find a tractor in a barn not too far away. This guy says particularly a fucking a lot and I hate it. Ah. Just after we found it, we heard screaming in the fields, and gunfire as well. Meaning that the kids clearly found something they didn't like. 
Gobbledick wanted to go help them, or at least find out what's been doing this, but Senator Fister, Coney, and I agree that, meh, they're just children. Strangely, so did Mackenzie. We all get back in the van that we took here, and Mackenzie hotwires it. The kid hotwires it? Fucking wacked. This time I drive, and we head back to the commune. We get about halfway there before meeting with some other guys in white jumpsuits. Only... They're also wearing bulletproof vests and carrying assault rifles. So we stop the car and I roll down the window to speak to them. Well, hi there, sugar. What brings y'all out here in this time of night, baby? I say in my best southern bell voice. I have absolutely no idea why I did this. I think I just thought that it was something ridiculous and in character. If you're having a hard time imagining this... Just imagine an ancient man wearing a Nazi SS uniform talking like that. After some more talking, the guards eventually agree to escort us back to the compound because we insist on speaking to a director after seeing what we saw. We get back and this time find an entirely new guy waiting for us. And now the guards are calling him Director Scott. Where the fuck is the last man? Coney asked. I thought Mr. Nathan was the director. I'd like to stop and say that my friend, Hasconi, had spent a year in Uganda helping out the people there. Because of that, he was doing a near flawless Ugandan accent and everything. <laughs> what the fuck is the last man? Director Scott informs us that there never was a director Nathan. The only Nathan in the commune is a sanitation worker. Senator Fister starts going on about how sneaky poor people are after that. We're all left really confused at this point, because we mentioned Director Nathan to Phil back when he was alive and he seemed to be totally aware of Director Nathan. We would have questioned this further, but we liked Director Scott, so we didn't give a shit. By this point, it was around 10 at night. Director Scott tells us that we should be getting to sleep and then gives us a cryptic warning about how we should, under no circumstances, go outside at night. A bit unnerved further, we decide to head over to where we'd be living, with each of us piling in mine and Chuck's cars to get there. Our living quarters was an honest-to-god log cabin. Only by log cabin, it was massive. Two stories and more than enough room for all of us to live there. I want to unpack all of my stuff into the cabin, but when I go to the door to try and open it to get into my car, I notice that a sort of electronic lock has been activated, preventing me from opening the thick door. I try my key, but it doesn't work either. We all wanted to give a shit, but none of us really could. I decide to sleep on the couch in the living room for the night while the others turn in. I don't really know why I did it, I think I just wanted someone to survive in case the rooms are wired with explosives or killer robots or Shagoth or something. The GM tells me that we all wake up around 2am to a really loud and obnoxious sound that seems to be coming from the entry hallway. I, being the closest, get up and investigate. It's the electric door lock. It suddenly unlocked itself. Before I can really do anything, the GM tells Gobbledick, <laughs> Gobbledick, goddammit, the GM tells Gobbledick, who's sleeping on the second floor right next to Senator Fister, that he hears slow and steady walking along the roof of his house, right above his room, and it's slowly headed for his window, which also has had its electric lock disabled. Without hesitation, he gets out his gun and points it at the window. He sees the silhouette of a vaguely humanoid figure covered in spikes crawling down the wall, looking in through the window, reaching a clawed hand to open it. Three shots each hitting the fucker later, it falls a full story down as dead as can be. We all hear the gunshots at this point. I grab my trusty Sturmgewehr 44 and Coney is effing foul. 762 real fucking NATO. Mackenzie grabs her throwing knives and Chuck his shotgun and axe. Meanwhile, Senator Fister is busy pushing his furniture up against his window and door. <laughs> the GM says that we can hear inhuman screaming from all around us. Dozens of separate voices. 
It's at this moment that I wish that I had been able to unpack my car. Everyone rushes into the living room. Chuck, Coney, and Gobbledick are all barricading entrances. While Mackenzie had somehow used her superb climbing skill to climb to the top of the chandelier hanging over the middle of the room. I, on the other hand, went to the bar and started downing a fifth of whiskey. If I was going to die, it wouldn't be sober. The living room of this cottage was quite large, and the back wall was almost entirely a single window which overlooked a lake, about 200 feet away from us. This will come up later. To make a long battle short, the fuckers came at us from every direction and we kept on gunning them down. After each of us losing probably half of our hit points a person, and with over a dozen of the fuckers dead, we finally felt as though we had won. I immediately took this opportunity and ran to my car. I threw open the trunk door and grabbed a Panzer Shrek, a few rockets, and one of my stick grenade boxes. Herr Schnitzel Nazi always carries around at least a thousand rounds of ammo with him, so I was fine on that front. While I was doing this, shit was going down in the cabin. The others noticed a massive, monstrous being that started coming out of the lake. Something so strange that you had to roll a sanity check just to keep from going mad when you saw it. Most everyone passed the check, except for poor Chuck and Senator Fister, who had rejoined the group. I just got back when this thing came out. Chuck and Senator Fister immediately started walking towards it as if they were in a trance. Desperate to protect his senator, Gobbledick restrained him from walking to the beast in the lake. Unfortunately for Chuck, no one was strong enough to stop him from getting there. So I decided to do the next best thing. Suicide bomber mode. Gobbledick had knocked Senator Fister unconscious, and while the rest of the party was doing everything they could to stall Chuck, I grabbed some twine, which the GM said I had hundreds of feet of in the kitchen. Why? I have no idea. I tied the twine to the ends of each grenade and started placing them everywhere on Chuck. When he had about 20 grenades tied to him, <laughs> we let him walk to the beast at the edge of the lake. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I thought that um, Herr Schnitzel was going to be a suicide bomber. Nope, he, uh, he volunteered Chuck. Motherfucker. <laughs> I kept the ends just loose enough so that I wouldn't pull the pins early, but just taut enough so that I could pull them with ease. Just when Chuck reached the creature and it got close enough to him, I pulled back the strings. I could not have wished for a bigger explosion. Chuck blew up right next to the thing and practically half the fucker was gone. The GM said that it wasn't dead yet though and was just sort of pathetically trying to slink its way back into the water. Without hesitation, I loaded my Panzer Shrek and blew the fucker to pieces. But not before saying, you're the ugliest fucking trout I've ever seen. For whatever it could do, it couldn't survive getting hit with an anti-tank weapon. That concluded our first session. Of the other big tales, which I will tell another time, there are the following. The pig roast, the incident with the boats, the toilet hand, fire and blood, and the grand finale, killing the gods. Well, I, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this ballad of Herr Schnitzel Nazi, the geriatric Nazi monster killing machine. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that and uh, leave Nick to take over the next part. I'll see y'all next time.